Secrets and Spies presents Espresso Martini with Chris Carr and Matt Fulton. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Espresso Martini. Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Chris. Uh, how are, how are you? This is a loaded question, though. How are how are you, Chris? <laughs> well, I think I've got a new profession as a medium. You know, I just I've just come off a recording that had a few problems and spent half the time saying the the name of the guest and like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Just give me a sign. You can hear me. So, uh, so that maybe that's my new profession in January. Do <laughs> what's the what's the general audio quality through like a Ouija board? Can you? It, does it sound really crisp? You know, or it's a good question actually. And there doesn't appear to be on. You know, when you create a Zoom link, it gives you like options to phone in. There's no Ouija board link for Zoom, uh, which is a bit you of a uh, over oversight there on zoom's part but uh, yeah i think i think you might be able to get up to mp4 quality out of a ouija board but i think it would know. really um <laughs> open up our range of potential guests it would yeah if Go we on, could get, get like a zoom it, yes yes oh that would be interesting <laughs> oh my goodness yeah. what's what's that crackling sound in the background mm. henry what's that going on <laughs> is it screams what is what is that <laughs> Oh anyway, my goodness. We're off to yeah, a good start today. We are, we are indeed. <laughs> so just <laughs> just the listeners have no idea what we're on about. Um I, I've just come off a very uh complicated recording for a client of mine. <laughs> um and we had a few technical problems that that were quite painful. But there we go. So uh hoping we'll have no technical problems here. We're in a good calm space. So on today's uh espresso martini, and I think I'm definitely uh uh, erring on the espresso more than the martini today um, after <laughs> my first Christmas party in six years, which was pretty good. Um, so on today's episode, we're going to look at the uh, what the Israeli intelligence services may have known prior to October the 7th. And yep, Matt. What was the vibe of the party? Was it like a Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy Christmas kind of party? Or was it like a... Oh, no. Because we, we, we don't want those kind of Christmas parties. <laughs> No, it wasn't Tinker Tailor. Okay. Uh, it was. I was. It wasn't wild. Uh, you know, most of the guests were forty plus, and it was sort of mm-hmm. a businessy thing. But uh, so people were well behaved and things. But it was just. It was just fun. Lots of chatting, lots of uh, lots of drinking, and it was a uh, you know a, a, a semi unlimited tab at the bar. So you know, mm. people were just drinking away. Um, you didn't figure good. out. Who the who the mole was? There was no uh, there was no Bill Hayden in the corner that you were sort of scoping out the whole time. Well, I did meet a very interesting Shakespearean actress who was married to um, an actor who passed away just a few years ago, who had been in Rumple of the Old Bailey. Um, and then, <laughs> what else did I mean? Mm. Oh my goodness! Um, yeah, yeah, definitely no, no, not that I, I didn't encounter any spies last night. So whether okay. uh, knowingly, anyway, may may well have done about knowing it. But <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I'm sorry. I'll um, I'll yeah. let you get back to the important stuff here. I know this this <laughs> right. bodes well for the tone of this episode. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, uh, on today's episode, we'll be looking at the uh, what the Israeli intelligence may or may not have known prior to the seventh of October. Hamas mass terrorist attack. We will then look at reports of traders who may have uh, profited off the attacks. Then we're going to move on to a developing spy scandal involving an alleged Cuban mole within the US State Department. And then we'll wrap things up on Espresso Martini by looking at the situation between Venezuela and Guyana over an oil-rich disputed territory. Then on our Patreon-only show, Extra Shot, we will be looking at the financing of Hamas um, and then the ongoing ideological debate within US universities over the 7th of October attacks. We'll also be looking at some aggressive sonar use by the Chinese Navy targeting Australian divers. And then we will finish up on some Ukrainian special forces action against the main railway line between Russia and China. So to get access to Extra Shot, you'll need to be a Patreon subscriber. You just go to Patreon patreon.com forward slash secrets and spies and pick the subscription level that works for you and depending on which level you pick you'll get a free cup or coaster or set of coasters um, and our eternal gratitude so uh matt first off we've got um, a story you picked which is the what israel may or may not have known about the 7th of october attack so i'll let you kick off with that one indeed yeah so this kind of a landmark story in the in the times that dropped earlier this week by ronan bergman and uh, Adam Goldman, Ronan Bergman, sort of like the 
the David Ignatius of the Israeli mm. uh, intelligence community, you know, sort of like their unofficial chronicler and mouthpiece is a loaded term, but yeah. they certainly speak through him and 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 vent their frustrations through him. He's kind of like their their therapist. Anyway, and that seems to be what sort of happened in this article. So the article is called uh, Israel Knew Hamas's Attack Plan More Than a Year Ago. So here are some sort of details. Uh, Israeli officials had knowledge of Hamas's battle plan for the terrorist attack on October 7th, more than a year before it occurred. The 40-page document, codenamed Jericho Wall, detailed a devastating invasion, including rocket attacks, drones, and gunmen using various means to enter Israel. Mm. The plan also included sensitive information about the location and size of Israeli military forces, raising concerns about possible leaks within the Israeli security establishment. Despite the detailed plan, Israeli military and intelligence officials dismissed it as aspirational and beyond Hamas's capabilities. A veteran analyst with Unit 8200, Unit 8200 is what's commonly called the uh, Israeli National SIGINT Agency, okay. yeah. I believe is what its full name is. It's essentially their NSA or their yeah. GCHQ. Um, it's it's very small, but very capable. Um, and its uh, its officers are all like very young, yeah, like like eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old, like very young. I suppose is it the conscription service, isn't it over there? So a lot of their soldiers are super young. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's 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 a it's this it's the conscription thing, and also I mean it's it's a lot of them that are just very kind of tech savvy. They get mm, kind of just mm. swept up into the unit. That's where their you know yeah, yeah. specialties lie, I guess. Anyway, I digress. A veteran analyst with Unit 8200 warned of a Hamas training exercise similar to the Jericho Wall plan just three months before the attack, but her concerns were brushed off by a colonel in the Gaza division. Officials concede that if the warnings had been taken seriously, Israel could have possibly prevented or mitigated the attacks. The Israeli military was unprepared as terrorists streamed out of the Gaza Strip, resulting in the deadliest day in Israel's history. The Jericho Wall document reveals a cascade of missteps and the worst Israeli intelligence failure since the Arab-Israeli War of 1973. The failure was rooted in the belief that Hamas lacked the capability and intention to launch a large-scale attack despite evidence to the contrary. The document was among several versions of attack plans collected over the years, highlighting a history of Hamas drafting such plans. The failures to connect the dots are likened to the intelligence failures ahead of 9-11. Israeli security officials acknowledge the failure, and a government commission is expected to study the events leading up to the attacks. Chris, what did you think about this? Well, yeah, God, what an interesting article. I mean, if this reporting is correct and the Israeli intelligence services did know this in advance, then this is a terrible failure. And I think we mentioned in the... Uh, it was either the last episode of Espresso Martini or the one before about the dangers of underestimating your enemy's capacity to do harm. Yep. Um, and again, it feels like that may well have played into this. I would be interested to know how accurate some of the details in the Jericho, uh, Jericho Wall plans were on Israeli defences and why that may not have set off alarm bells. Because if they were accurate about, like, I don't know, there were precisely 30 soldiers here, 45 there, and something else, you would have thought that this this plan that people weren't taking that seriously, if it started to match up with least um, reality on your side, you would hope that would set off some sort of alarm bell. And this plan does feel more specific and detailed than the infamous uh, President's Daily Brief titled Bin Laden's Intent to Strike America in the Days Before 9-11 Attacks. You know, this is definitely much more detailed than that. Oh, yeah. um, and then, you know, the Israeli intelligence services are considered some of the best in the world, partially due to their intense focus on threats from Hamas, Hezbollah and Iran. Yet it does feel to me, and I could be wrong on this, but it feels to me in the last few years they've been a bit behind the curve. They've reportedly had very little to do with the war in Ukraine, despite the fact that Russia are using Iranian weapons, which should be of interest to Israel. And on top of that, the Israeli government have had this sort of odd relationship with the Russian government that now has backfired. So it feels like it's been a terrible drop in focus somewhere, if this reporting is correct. Um, also, these are plans that have been obtained. I'm assuming, and I could be wrong here, but I'm assuming they've come from a human source within Gaza or Hamas. Because j- unless it was a intercepted email, it's kind of unusual through SIGINT to get sort of you know a document isn't it um that goes into great details you might get fragments of a document but unless you get the full email um is unlikely to have come electronically but again i could be wrong there um 
then um yeah, and I was also kind of shocked that the um that the signals intelligence that had indicated a day long exercise by Hamas on the lines of this plan that was um you know was dismissed by a senior officer. So this analyst basically alerted their their boss to say that there's been a training exercise that's very similar to this plan that we've got from Hamas. We should be paying attention to this. And it was just dismissed. And that just is crazy. And it does sound like the analyst was on the ball, but the senior leadership were less so. So the question is, why was that? So this very much appears to be a management or leadership failure. Um, and aside from the tragedy that the 7th of October tax was, there is also a sad note to add um, in that part of the underestimating came down to Israel believing that Hamas, the Hamas authorities in Gaza were not looking for a war. And uh, they based this on work permits being sought and Hamas supposedly turning down their genocidal charter in 2017. Yet ultimately, all of this appears to have been a ruse on Hamas's part just to sort of buy time and buy intelligence to, um, you know, to send people into Israel to gather intelligence of the targets that they were planning to um, act against. So, yeah. And one, one other note as well. I saw on Twitter, um, there some CIA people I follow, and there seemed to be a belief that maybe um, the Signals Intelligence Analyst who raised the alarm bell, obviously she was a woman, as reported, and there's a belief that she might have been ignored due to the fact that she being a woman and her superior being a man. Because apparently stuff like that did happen at the CIA in the late 90s with regards mm. to the threat from al-Qaeda. Because there was a lot of female analysts at the um, Alex station who apparently yeah. were dismissed quite often. And it, and some people believe it was because they were women and the senior leadership were mainly men. So there may be a factor of that too. So yeah, it, 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 it does paint a very... Um, concerning and disappointing picture, and I think something that I hope the that there will be a proper investigation, and that the proper actions are taken against this negligence because it's really bad. Because what's the point of having this super all-seeing, all-knowing intelligence service if you're not going to listen to the information you get from it? So yeah, yeah. So thank you for pointing that article out because it's very interesting. And, and did you have any sort of extra thoughts on it? Yeah, it's it's funny that you brought up the Bin Laden PDB. I sort of had here, you know that that. Mm famously, you know, it was picked apart in the 9-11 Commission and stuff. Uh, the title Bin Laden Determined to Strike in the U.S., That's which it, came yeah. out um, yeah. shortly before 9-11. I don't know if it was mm. a couple of days or a week. Or free. It was... It was Yeah, it's sort of like, like the weekend before or something. It was yeah, literally yeah. days. It was, it was yeah. very... But basically what that said was, essentially all it mm. said was, mm. what, what the title is, Bin Laden's Determined to Strike in the U.S., yeah. like Al-Qaeda's yeah. trying to do it, Mm. somewhere mm. with something and that's sort of all that sort of went up to the white house at that level mm. right at that mm. time you know which you know if i'm a policymaker if i'm sitting in the nsc or whatever and i get this i, I think okay yes al-qaeda is determined to attack the united states like that's like saying like the pope is catholic you know <laughs> yeah like yes but what do I what do, what do what do we do with that? And of course, also yeah, we knew that like there were these um, Saudis out there that were taking flying lessons and and weren't interested in sort of learning how to take off or land, you know. Which in hindsight, yeah, that's all kind of suspicious. And you know, there there were plenty of stuff that the FBI and the intelligence community could have put together and stuff. Yeah, but they didn't have. It's not like that PDB that came to the White House before 9-11 had, like, specific names of, like, Muhammad Atta and such, or flight numbers, or, mm -hmm. you know, they were going to hit the Pentagon, the World Trade Center, you know, and they are going to try to hit, I think it was the White House or the Capitol, right? They didn't have that, you know? But the Israelis here, essentially, with this plan, they essentially did. Like, they, they didn't have a date. Mm. They didn't know it was October 7th. Mm. You know, Hamas probably didn't know what the precise date was going to be until not too long before the 7th. You know, there's all kinds of sort of tactical operational considerations that go into deciding, yeah, this is the day. You know, you don't set that way far in advance because all kinds of stuff can go down, you know. But they essentially had, they had the plan. They knew what they were going to do, what they wanted to do. They saw there's a, a training ground. I think the IDF even like rated it yesterday or something there's a trading ground in southern gaza it used to be an airport but it's kind of um yeah it's just kind of open hilly kind of terrain there's a very rudimentary dirt airstrip there 
And I remember reading this shortly after the attack that um, Hamas had been filmed there yeah. not too long ago training with paragliders. Yeah. You know? It's just terrible, isn't it? Um, like, it was all right there, like, in front of your, in front of their faces, like, much more, in much more detail than we even had with 9-11, like, explicitly, you know? And I think, like, it, it wouldn't have taken and the article sort of talks about this to to an extent it wouldn't have taken that much even like a general alert across the idf southern command earlier that night even could have blunted i think the worst of the attack you know like i don't think hamas would enable to like hold villages for 12 hours you know in that i mean yeah like um a lot of those forces around Gaza had been redeployed into the West Bank because Bibi's right wing government wanted to, you know, back up the settlers doing all kinds of mm. uh, horrendous shit, you yeah. know, yeah, in the West Bank, yeah, um, which is certainly one thing. But I, I don't know. I think that 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 the belief that Hamas lacked the capability to carry out the attack plan, and they wouldn't dare do so. And dismissing all evidence to the contrary is just like kind of stunning in its arrogance. You know, I, I think uh, I think this will prove to rank rather high on the list of historical military and intelligence blunders. Mm. Um, it, it's a stunning failure of the social contract between the Israeli government and its people. I mean, worse than that, I mean, the cost of it is is staggering and not just for Israel. I mean— more civilians have been killed in Gaza in two months than Russia has killed in Ukraine in two years. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. And should sure. say something about how we think mm. and talk about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mm. Mm. Rightfully mm. so. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it also states that this article also states, and I guess the plan as well, this was said by the Israeli analyst who sort of emailed this up the chain of command, that the attack was designed to spark a war. I think given the extreme violence and depravity of Hamas's tactics on October 7th, I think Israel had a unique, I've said this on, on, on here before, Israel had a unique opportunity on October 7th and the 8th to turn Arab and world public opinion against mm. Hamas as mm. was turned against ISIS, and they mm. squandered it mm. almost immediately. You know, yeah, like you th- Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's some very interesting things going on on that front, actually. But yeah, carry on, sorry. You mentioned earlier how, you know, um, the Israeli intelligence community seems to have, like, lost a step, mm. you know. Um, I, I I think they've essentially probably been hobbled by politics. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, they spent the summer, people in the Israeli intelligence community spent most of the summer with, you know, with the protests surrounding Netanyahu's judicial mm. reforms, quote unquote, well, yeah, um, yeah. saying that this puts us in a terrible position. It's going to damage Israeli security and it leaves us open to to something like this happening. Um, it's just I don't know. It, it, it contributes to my general sort of just exhaustion and frustration and horror with the whole thing about how unnecessary and yet predictable this all has been. Yeah, and it's set back, you know, we've said this before, we'll probably say it again later, I mean, it feels like it's set back any potential peace process back decades. I mean, Netanyahu's government had no intention of a peace process prior to this, really, um, and there's been no pressure, um, there was no pressure during the Trump administration for to include the Palestinians in any way, shape, or form in any uh, things going on. And, and obviously Israel's reaction to... Um, the 7th of October attacks has not really won any hearts and minds in the Arab world. No. Um, I mean, it just, it's an interesting thing. Like with my chat, Malcolm Nance a few weeks back and he's echoed elements of this on Twitter as well. It does seem to be this, there is um, more sympathy for Israel's situation than maybe we believe. Um, certainly in the I Gulf thought, States. I wondered that. Yeah. In the Gulf States, there's much more sympathy for Israel than there is in other places. And I think it's just more with the Gulf States stuff. I think people are just a bit more savvy about Hamas and know that they aren't good people and they don't really represent the Palestinians and they're the ones who kind of led to this situation. And I think yeah. there's a fear in Gulf States that um, that this may spill over and disrupt the kind of how things are for them at the moment. 
Um, but at the same time, like places like Qatar, I mean, they're not exactly completely clean of all this either because they've got senior yeah. Hamas leadership there. And, you know, as we'll talk about later, they've been giving money to Hamas and things like that, as have Iran um, and stuff. So it's, it's all very murky. But one thing I will note, actually, I mean, the hearts and minds thing, I was just walking around London the other day and there was a big mural um, near where I was, where I was, and I saw this, uh, you know, obviously Muslim lady with her um, pram and two young sons with her, and she stopped her pram and got her two young sons to pose by this mural of the of the Palestinian flag and point at it. And I don't think the kids really knew what it all meant. They're only about less than five years old, um, but that photograph will live on their family memory now. And um, you know the. The yeah, I just don't think Israel really won any um, favors for uh, a lot of ordinary people on the ground, should we say, away from the politicians and the the wealthy yeah. people. I think um, you know the sort of bombing the bejesus out of uh, Gaza as they have done um, is just uh, it, it it sort of played into what you know Tom uh, not Tom Nichols sorry Tom Parker calls the terrorist trap, where it feels like Israel have totally uh, potentially overreacted. Um, and gone for a sort of scorched earth policy, which then gives these terrorist groups a bit of a moral upper hand again, because the moral authority that Israel may have had, even though I'd say, sadly, traditionally, I think Israel's always been quite low on moral authority in the eyes of Arabs uh, in, in the Middle East. And so maybe Israel just feels, screw it, they don't like us anyway, so we'll just do what we're going to do. Um, but yeah, very, very complicated situation. It's not getting any easier by the day, is it? Yeah. I wonder about you know you mentioned the Muslim woman and her mm. her 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 kids who took the picture with the Palestinian flag mural. I wonder then. I mean, there's a there's a context there that's important, mm. and I think I understand fully how a Muslim woman um, or any Muslim person, or e even a non-Muslim person mm. of any any religious faith. Yeah. Um, would see a, but Muslims especially, would see a sort of cultural and religious affinity with the Palestinians and and sympathize with their plight over, you know, decades, the belief in the dispossession of their land and everything that they've sort of suffered. And that's, I think, is a, it's a reasonable position to have. It, it's not going to be one that everyone agrees with, and that's mm. that's mm. also fine. But I think to have just that position is okay, right? But there's a difference between sympathizing with and supporting the Palestinian cause in general and then saying that because I support that cause, Hamas was right to— uh, cut a baby out of a pregnant woman alive mm. that that was justified or that's an a a a a justified act of armed resistance or to sort of obscure and conspiracy theory arise mm -hmm. that, that's not a word but, <laughs> but you know, know what i mean yeah just sort of go down the conspiracy rabbit hole to say that oh well that didn't actually happen mm. you know what i mean and mm. that's why i'm standing with the palestinian flag yeah. like that's yeah. that's two very different things yeah well it is it is and I, and I, I and my problem i think like with because I, I i don't um have an issue per se with people who who want free palestine i get it um, I just have a problem with people who don't take a time to really fully understand what Hamas is and to see that Hamas are making life very difficult for ordinary Palestinians in Gaza. You know, they've run pretty much a totalitarian regime of sorts in Gaza for, is it about 17 years now, of no elections um, and, also, yeah, and, and, you yeah. know, and suppressing any political um, sort of um, differences and things like that. Um, and that's not a particularly great situation either. And I think like in, I've always felt that in the West where we have it a lot easier than other places in the world, maybe we have a bit of a responsibility to take a deeper look at things uh, and be a bit more savvy about the complexity of stuff because we've got the luxury of our situation um, mm -hmm. And this has been one of my frustrations with a lot of the protests I see and, and online is very 
I like of all the people I follow on Instagram, which is obviously a very this is not represented the entire world, but not one person that I've seen so far, other than two Israelis that I know, have mentioned anything critical about Hamas. It's all been about the ceasefire and it's all on Israel's plate rather than acknowledging Hamas the fact that they have hostages. Um nobody seems to talk about the hostages. Um and then when you see a lot of the protests that have been happening in London, uh, again I've only had selected viewing through um, through either mainstream media or some sites that have been, should we say, somewhat critical and highlighted some of the more anti-Semitic and difficult things. But aside from those things, you very with the mainstream media coverage, when you see the wide shot of all the flags, I've yet to see one saying anything about Hamas. It's always just about free Palestine and ceasefire. There's not one word about Hamas or the hostages. And one very famous um, human rights campaigner in the UK called Peter Tatchell, um, and he's always been very good on talking about the dangers of Islamism and things like that. And he has, you know, it's of a left wing persuasion. He's not a foaming at the mouth right wing uh, xenophobe or anything like that. Um, he got turned away apparently from one of the protests because he did have a banner talking about the hostages and criticizing Hamas. See, um, that's yeah. So uh, there's there's been reports of like you know. That some of the organisers of these marches, I mean, generally a lot of the marches in the UK with this sort of topic tend to be run by people like Stop the War Coalition and so on, and they're all, you know, they're all very deeply, um, very sort of far left socialists who have always been critical of Israel. Um, so if they are marshalling those marches, then you're not going to see much nuance other than Israel's bad, America's bad, the West is bad. Um, you're not going to see the more detailed picture. You're just going to see the kind of activist point of view on these things. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it's horrifically complicated and, and things are not getting any easier with this particular topic, especially as every day, you know, Israel's bombing campaign is killing more people. Uh, more and more people are, you know, without home now. You've got um, civilians being pushed from, you know, north to south and people dying in between all that. And, oh, yeah, so it's, it's horrific, really. Um, but we do need to, us in the West, do need to always be harping on about Hamas because they're the ones who are making life difficult for the Palestinians ultimately. They're the ones who brought on this current wave of violence that has uh, totally destroyed you know, Gaza. Um, and they've given the Israeli right every excuse possible to do their very worst if they want to. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean say what you want about the the sort of economic and and humanitarian situation in Gaza on mm. October 6th and I mm. think that's a I think you would be absolutely right to be you know upset by that but there were no bombs falling on Gaza on October no. 6th no no None. no I, yeah loads have since so yeah yeah. Oh my goodness. So, um, well, why don't we? Should we segue into the traders who appeared? There's, so some people yes. seem to have benefited from the Hamas the Hamas attack. Did, yeah. Yeah. So there's a um, another article. I mean, this has been um, reported widely, uh, but the article that we're sort of using to ground the conversation here is called "Unknown Traders Appeared to Have Anticipated October 7th Hamas Attack." Research finds, and that's by Matt Egan at CNN. Um, so some details here. Bets against the value of Israeli companies surged before the October 7th Hamas attacks, indicating potential advanced knowledge of the terror attack. Preliminary research by law professors from Columbia University and New York University reveals a significant and unusual spike in short selling of the MSCI Israel ETF, so I guess it's a trading fund, uh, five days before the attack. Short selling activity far exceeded uh, that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2014 Israel-Gaza war, and the 2008 global financial crisis. The research suggests that traders with information about the impending attack may have profited from it. The paper, titled Trading on Terror, was authored by former SEC Commissioner Robert Jackson Jr. and Columbia Law Professor Joshua Mitz. On October 2nd, just five days before the attack, almost 100% of off-trading volume in the uh, ETF consisted of short-selling. The authors believe there may have been more undisclosed trading activity behind the scenes. The researchers cannot link specific traders to the transactions or determine their information sources. Regulators, including the SEC and FINRA, have access to non-public data that could aid in investigating market behavior before October 7th. 
Bets against Israeli securities on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange also increased significantly in the days leading up to the attack. Short selling in Israeli companies on U.S. exchanges did not show a corresponding increase, possibly due to some defense companies benefiting from higher demand post-attack. An increase in short-dated options contracts on shares of Israeli firms traded on U.S. exchanges was also observed. The study concludes that evidence is consistent with informed traders anticipating and profiting from the Hamas attack. Some experts view the study as interesting but preliminary, noting that trading may reflect informed assessments or algorithmic activity. Mm -hmm. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, again, so similar to 9-11, isn't it, where somebody um, has betted against the value of Israeli companies in this particular case. Um, You know, with terrorist groups there's always a huge financial component that many people ignore um so obviously terrorist groups make a lot of money through donations they make it through hostage taking for ransom and sometimes they make it by being smart on the stock market or even with crypto these days as well um and and i am surprised the cia didn't pick this up because reportedly they have real-time access to the stock market and they look out for things like this since post 9-11 um so you know in the u.s domestic uh, financial intelligence is handled by the treasury but international falls under the cia um and so it's it's interesting that no, no alarm bells were supposedly raised obviously it might have been raised behind closed doors but certainly nothing has kind of come up that we see in the public domain the israeli regulator uh the isa apparently have re- done a re-examination because it's a report and they're saying it did not raise any concerns regarding suspicious activity on the stock exchange in israel during the relevant days but the big thing is the isa only deal with um you know only reflect trading um, activity in israel so they aren't looking at the whole international picture either and then the u.s regulators don't comment on open investigations so we're kind of in this weird place now with this where yeah. um You've got this sort of report by these two guys that still, um, I think it's it's still yet to be peer reviewed as far as I know. But um, so we're kind of left with a lot of kind of questions. But at the same time, you know, terrorists aren't stupid. So if they can make money off something they know they're about to do, yeah. then it wouldn't put it past them. Uh, yeah, you you raise a good point here that the paper is still a uh, draft. Mm. Um I mean, the you know the academic sort of research kind of community. It goes through this whole kind of rigorous process that you mentioned you know, with peer review and everything. So the paper is a draft right now. So we don't. It's all kind of. It's more like, hey, this is this is interesting. We don't know what it is, but it looks weird, right? Um, I mean, yeah, I think there are some uh, analysts at CIA or in the Treasury's um, Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence that are awfully busy right now. I think some to entertain some speculation on the traders identities mm. if the paper is accurate i was sort of thinking a bit like who i mean there could definitely be individuals in the gulf mm. perhaps in cutter uh who would have had some could have had some inside track on hamas's operational planning via relationships with people connected to hamas's political bureau mm. you know um and i mean their sort of advanced knowledge wouldn't need to be as explicit as hamas is going to do y and mm. z on x mm. dates but it could have been something as simple as like hey israel's going to go through some things next week wink wink you know and then from there you sort of act accordingly on yeah. the markets whether yeah. or not you know exactly what's going to happen or mm. when mm. you just know something's mm. going to happen mm. you know so mm. let me be a greedy son of a bitch and take advantage of it yeah um I think there may have, again, totally speculating here. The paper doesn't say this. The article doesn't say this. I'm just sort of thinking, you know, what what might what might it have been? Um, there, I mean, maybe you could have a you could have had a, a cutout working on behalf of the Iranians mm-hmm. that made these yeah. trades. True. Um, yeah. I mean, the IRGC, especially the Quds Force, due to you know sanctions, is almost entirely funded through black market ventures and shady backroom dealing. You know, they, I mean, so the, I've talked about this with Phillips Mike a lot, you know, their, um, the sort of degree to which Iran knew of the attack or had some sort of operational control over the planning or the execution of it is sort of widely up for debate. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem that they sort of pushed a button and said, mm. okay, do this, mm. but they definitely did know a lot, mm. right? Um, would have known enough to have 
benefited themselves on the markets, right? Yeah. If they wanted to. Yeah. So that's certainly out there. I think ultimately, you know, we may never get a satisfactory answer to the story, but it'll surely help fuel conspiracy theories for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. You know, in the yeah. back of my head, the sort of, you know, bad 24 final threat sort of screenplay idea is, oh, it was Netanyahu, you know, and mm -hmm. he knew about it all along. Mm -hmm. Again, don't at me. I'm not suggesting that. I do not mm -hmm. think that happened at all. No. But there's but, going to be some conspiracy theory, especially with the yes. intelligence failure too. I can see it already. Yes, it's nice that, into Alex Jones's kind of interpretation of world events. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. That conspiracy theory writes itself. And I mean, mm. you know, like I don't think the 9/11 Commission ever sort of found hard evidence that there was kind of like widespread shorting of insurance or airline mm. sort of stocks. Mm. Um, I don't know that we ever have. I, I don't know that we have a, a, a set answer on that, yeah, but yeah. I mean, it's still, it's still out there, mm. you know, even, you know, 20 plus years later, I think a lot of people believe that, you know, Saudis or someone in the Gulf profited mm. from it. Well, maybe the answers are too uncomfortable to publicly share because there's a whole lot of stuff about Saudi Arabia that's still yet to be shared in the public domain. Even I think there's some movement oh, on that sure. now, isn't there? Something's happening. Yeah, the families, sort of, the, mm. the victims, the 9-11 victims, uh, families have been, I think, in lawsuits for many years about getting stuff declassified and, you know, mm. either suing the Saudis directly, which I think a couple administrations now have, have blocked, have blocked those lawsuits, yeah, um, yeah. which I don't, I don't think it's a very, eh, it's, it, it's complicated, but it's, it's um, geopolitics, isn't it? It's the problem, isn't yeah, it? It's like, it's, it doesn't it's, benefit it's, individuals. It just sort of is what's the best bad deal we can get today. Yeah. It? yeah. It's a really, <laughs> um, it's a really shitty situation, how you handled it. I can sort of see it both ways. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, keep, keep your eyes peeled on this folks. It's certainly an interesting, it's certainly an interesting development. Yeah. Well, let's take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Right, back from our little break there. Um, so we're now moving on to uh, a kind of classic spy story in some respects. So we've got a former career US diplomat has been charged with secretly spying for Cuban intelligence for decades. Manuel Roca, a former American diplomat, has been charged with serving as a secret agent for communist Cuba for several decades, dating back to at least 1981 when he joined the US Foreign Service. So basically, this guy may have been a spy for Cuba for my entire lifespan, which is quite interesting, because I was born in 1981, so there we are. Um, and the charges against Roker include engaging in clandestine activity on Cuba's behalf, meeting with Cuban intelligence operatives, and providing false information to US government officials about his contact with Cuba. Uh, the case highlights Cuba's long-standing efforts, according to American officials, to target U.S. government officials who could be turned into spies. Roker was arrested by the FBI in Miami, and he appeared in court where he wept as he was ordered held pending a bond hearing, and he has not commented on the charges. The case against Roker relies on his own admission made to an undercover FBI agent posing as a Cuban intelligence operative named Miguel. Roker praised Fidel Castro. He referred to the U.S. as the enemy and claimed to have served as a Cuban mole in the u.s foreign policy circles for over 40 years and his apparent deception includes portraying himself as a right-wing supporter even though he worked for the administration of both parties and it is believed that roca may have joined the state department at the direction of the cuban intelligence services possibly earning a master's degree in international relations from georgetown university under their suggestion his elite education may have facilitated his path within the U.S. government. I'm getting kind of shades of the Cambridge Five here. Um, and, and Roker's apparent motivation for serving as a Cuban agent appears to be ideological rather than financial. He's expressed strong support for the Cuban Revolution and referred to himself as a comrade working for the right reasons and the revolution. Now, while Roca's indictment does not provide operational details, it is suggested that there were clandestine communications between Roca and Cuban handlers. The current charges against him are for failing to register as a foreign agent, but it is noted that there may be more severe espionage charges in the future as more evidence is gathered. Cuban intelligence is known for its effective recruitment and tradecraft, making detection challenging, and they often target individuals across various professions, including academics and diplomats. 
diplomats. Now, I will stress that this is an ongoing court case, and obviously Roka could be found innocent, and this could all be some sort of, I don't know, mistake or whatever, but it, the the fact that the US government have uh, taken him to court does suggest that there's quite a lot of evidence against him. But uh, we don't know if he is guilty or not at this stage. Anyway, Matt, any thoughts on, on your part there? This was, this was interesting here. So you flagged two articles about this one is from the guardian and then the second one is from jeff stein's spy talk uh substack which everyone listening should subscribe to if they don't so the the first article in the guardian and i haven't had a i haven't had a chance to to read the doj's uh, charging Mm. documents yet but apparently because the first article in in the guardian i had the impression that he was being charged as a unregistered foreign agent yeah. of Cuba yeah. rather than a Cuban spy, which there's yeah. a difference between the two. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yes, yes. That's yeah. like, um, he's more like an advocate, an, an advocate uh, for Cuba rather than a, a, a somebody to cover a mole. Right. Like you're lobbying people yeah. and not registering head that, yeah, I, I lobby for a foreign government. Right. So like yeah. our, this is interesting. Our, uh, chairman of the Senate foreign relations committee is essentially, uh, under indictment right now as pretty much acting as an unregistered foreign agent of the Egyptians. Right. Doesn't mean he's an Egyptian spy. No. Right. No. But so this, the the spy talk article has a lot more details and essentially it, it says that the that the DOJ's criminal complaint is sort of very much devoid on details and i i correct me if 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 i'm wrong here but the DOJ is not asserting that he's a cuban spy at this moment right i don't believe so no they they are just saying he's in, um, hasn't registered uh, as a foreign okay. agent but uh, but that yeah, may so change mm. with a superseding indictment in the mm. future yeah if yeah. they feel that they have enough evidence to charge him with like espionage um that would stick in court right yeah this is it i think it's the difficulty of prosecuting espionage cases because he allegedly made a confession but a good lawyer could probably call that entrapment um right. that supposed confession to miguel the uh, undercover fbi agent you know it's uh yeah right we've talked about this before the the cubans are very the cuban intelligence service mm. it's very small mm. um hard to penetrate um, and they're very good because, I mean, we've talked about this before that like intelligence services that only focus on one thing and yeah. do it very well yeah. are very good. Supposedly, um, most people would have said such things about Mossad focusing on Hamas, Hezbollah, mm, Iran, mm. those like immediate threats to mm, Israel, mm. right? Cubans only focus on the U.S. and do it very well. I mean, you can be a Cuban national and operate in the U.S., especially in South Florida. No one will blink an eye mm. if there's a Cuban person running around South Florida. That's like it's like it on a day that ends in Y. You know, they're mm. all over the place. Mm. Um, and they they so they they kind of have an interesting business model, right? So they 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 gather intelligence on the U.S. and then sell that intelligence to like the Russians or the Chinese. Yeah. Or yeah. any other, yeah, country that sort of wants an inside track on what the U.S. is, but on on what the U.S. government is up to. Um, it's yeah, it's 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 interesting to me that we're sort of undecided. It seems like maybe even the federal government is undecided, at least in its sort mm. of speaking indictment as to whether or not this man is an unregistered foreign agent or a Cuban spy. Mm. Um, and that to me is sort of a big thing that's that that's that's left out. Jeff Stein's article here makes an interesting kind of assertion that in um, 2000, Roca sort of publicly declared that if um, Bolivian leftist Evo Morales was elected yeah. president, mm. that the U.S. would cut off its aid to Bolivia, and that pissed off a whole bunch of Bolivians. And, you know, potentially swung the election in Evo Morales' favor, which certainly did a favor to the Cubans, mm. you know? So, like, what could have just been written off as a as a 
I don't know, just sort of speaking something that could very much be in line with with U.S. foreign policy that, yeah, if this sort of socialist leftist kind of guy is elected in in, in Bolivia, then, yeah, we might reconsider our foreign aid mm. to Bolivia. Mm. You know, that's not really like a for U.S. policy. That's not a kind of a crazy thing to say. Right. Mm. But in that context, how he said it, where he said it, when he said it. Definitely, you can make the argument that that ultimately benefited the Cuban government. But that's something that unless you have some kind of operational tasking or you've intercepted communications or something between him and a, you know, Cuban handler or something, I don't know how you prove that in a court that he said this with Mm. under the express direction or with the explicit knowledge that that his words would mm. benefit the Cuban government. Like, if he accidentally benefited the Cuban government, that's not a crime. No, no, no. You know? Well, this is it. This is why the FBI likes to catch people. You know, they try and engineer the case so they can catch the person, like, delivering a dead drop or something. Um, yeah, like you know, uh, Robert and, Hansen. And, yeah. Yeah, and getting photographs then with, with known um, agents and things like that as well. Anna Montes. Well, yeah, that came up for me. Yeah. Yeah, Anna Montes was a DIA analyst. Um mm for the Defense Intelligence Agency, who uh, was working for the Cubans for a long time. And I guess um, Roca and Eva Montes met each other uh, They might well have done. She was, she was recruited at university as well. Against, yeah. Again, more shades of the Cambridge Five. It seems to me that the Cubans uh, allegedly are looking for students who are ideologically kind of inclined towards them and sort of left-wing politics and they try and guide them and they probably even give them financial support maybe through university and guide them into pathways that will lead to the intelligence services um and um yeah with with um Anna Montes that's definitely the case that definitely happened uh and she's out now but um it's the and it gets into that murky area of like talk about ethics and the recruitment of students is very dodgy practice and obviously the Russians have been doing it and the Cubans are doing it I don't Chinese. believe yeah I don't know if we do it in the west other than the tap on the shoulder in the old days at Oxford or Cambridge where it might lead to a career but it wasn't like I'm, I'm not aware of any cases where we've recruited foreign students but I could be completely wrong on that I might be very naive or just miss not know that but I don't, I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if we've done sure. that because I think our laws would probably get well. At least now, I think maybe in the you know up to the seventies, probably they may have done. But I think sort of post seventies, eighties, I think our laws would probably got more and more complicated to allow stuff like that to happen. To your point about recruiting on college campuses for the Cubans, I mean, if you think if your target is a an international relations, you know, major. Mm. at a U.S. university who mm. is, you know, left-wing, socialist even, inclined to sympathize with the Cuban government and oppose uh, the U.S.'s historic policies toward Latin America, which have not been great, have caused all kinds of problems throughout mm. the 20th century and even kind of into now, if you look at the migrant yeah. crisis yeah. From, from Venezuela and Central America and everything, you know... Um, especially without that kind of Soviet boogeyman behind the Cubans anymore, you know, to be like, well, if you sympathize with the Cubans, you're, 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 you're sympathizing with the Soviets. Now, without that kind of barrier anymore, mm-hmm. I think it would be any sort of, any kind of fancy international relations college campus, like you think, I don't know, Tufts or Georgetown mm-hmm. or, um, you know, Columbia or something that you have here. It's an extremely target rich environment for oh, yeah. for a Cuban intelligence officer trying mm. to find someone who who fits that ideological mm. profile that I just mm. there's no shortage of people. Yeah. And not just Cubans either anymore, as we're seeing with the whole sympathy for Hamas and oh, stuff. Yeah. It's it's yeah. it's you know, I think there's some right I mean, I think, you know, we talked about this, I think last episode, I can't remember if it was on um extra shot or espresso martini, but like when you're younger you can get very ideological. Um and partly, some of that's just down to you go for this period where at school and you know college, etc., you could have taught to think um, more ethically than the way people actually behave in the real world. And so when you finally go into the real world and employment, you start to realise things are much more backwards than you were led to believe. Um, yeah. 
and you don't understand sometimes the complexity around why things are the way they are. So it leads to, you know, it can lead to very positive change with new people coming in with new ideas and fresh approaches to stuff. But at the same time, also, it can lead to frustration and alienation and various other things. And it can lead some people to making life changing decisions that they may regret later on, like, you know, with the Cambridge Five, um, whether they regret it or not, I don't know. But, you know, ending up being like spies for the Russian government. And it started out as an ideological thing. Um, and whether over time they grew to regret that or not, it's open to debate. Um, and so, yeah, you've got to be a bit careful in your early years about kind of how far you go. I mean, I talked a bit about an experience where somebody tried to recruit me into um, a radical workers' revolutionary party thing. And, and, <laughs> and very quickly, I realized it was definitely not for me. So... <laughs> You know, you'll have to go to patreon.com to find out that story. But, um, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you've got to be a bit careful yeah. and it's right I mean, that's fertile a, ground. That's a good point you make, too, about you think a 20-year-old um, idealistic university student, yeah, their brain isn't fully cooked yet. Yeah. And to think that, like, to not really sort of understand the weight, the gravity, the implications that they're undertaking by deciding to work for a hostile foreign intelligence service well i think some people as well i i, I again this is a broad statement so feel free to disagree with me but um there is a sense i found that some people just naively don't think that there are hostile foreign intelligence services that there aren't hostile foreign powers there are some people out there today who seem to think we're the hostile and that's it and anything you know it, it, i've yeah. noticed this, especially on the um and my favorite topic lately, the far left, is just like because again, my experiences of people in the far left, they just sort of like I've I've had I've spoken to people in the past who've um rationaled support for China because they don't see China as historically an aggressive country, you know. And it's like, really? Um and, and that only, you know, the Or that Russia's not an imperialist country. Yeah, and that they have too. no history of empire. Yeah, and that too. And then what? yet we overly focus I mean, you know, we obviously we are supposed to focus on the bad policy decisions of our own country, but we do spend a lot of time dwelling on all the mistakes that Britain and America have made across the world, a particular you know, obviously recent examples with Iraq, Afghanistan. Um and um I think it just sometimes it can lead people down a very funny path that can lead to very poor decision making or lead to a sort of naivety that we're the bad guys um or the only bad guys or whatever um and and that there's no other you know sort of hostile services and i think also again like with the information space on the internet i think there's some people who seem to think that if information comes from sources other than western sources it must be more credible because it's come from somewhere without the quote unquote the filters and the and the editorial oversight that Western you know press has, um, and, and so I don't know. It's just it's a very I think being in your twenties is very difficult. There's a lot to catch up on in the world, um, and there's a lot of nuance you need to kind of grow to understand. And I think a lot of people, I don't. I think even a lot of people don't necessarily fully understand the full different shades of the political movement they're within. I know when I was younger, I've always identified as sort of being left wing. As I got a bit older, I've realized I'm more center left than left. Um, and I'm definitely not far left. Um, but I've grown to understand there are different degrees of leftism as there are different yeah. degrees of right wing politics too. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a lot of people out there who don't realize that. And so they become fellow travelers with people because they assume they're all on the same side. Like for me, the big eye opener was in 2014 when I filmed this event. Um, it was the it was a talk um, about uh, what was it the May Day? It was the May Day speeches in um, Trafalgar Square, and there was quite a lot of leading left wing speakers who were very pro Brexit, and that was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, and so when you look into it, the far left. I've never been huge fans of the European Union because it's a capitalist entity. And so their rationale was that as long as any as long as we're against anything capitalist, that's a positive. 
And my view is that's a very destructive way of thinking because, like, with the European Union, there's an awful lot of benefits. There's been a lot of sort of social rights connected to that, freedom of movement that's benefited people, um, you know, for careers and all sorts of things, even education that now in the UK are, are much more challenged and difficult than they used to be because of Brexit. And so that was the sort of... So you find left-wing people who you assume are thinking the same way you are, actually thinking in a very different way. And I, don't, I just don't get the impression a lot of people realise that sometimes. And that's me, very very general, very general, open to complaints on that one or, or challenges to that. But I just that's my observation over the years of some people, especially friends of mine in the arts world, stuff like that, who consider themselves leftists by default, but just don't realise um, the nuance of leftism sometimes. So yeah, <laughs> so it's my very general open wide statement there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, should we move to Venezuela? <laughs> or uh, maybe not. <laughs> I would rather stay here. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> but uh, you do what you want. <laughs> well, Venezuela is um, up to some interesting things at the moment. Um, so so the President uh, Maduro is accused of risking a venezuelan Guyanan conflict over an oil-rich region. So I'll start with... Guyana's Foreign Minister Hugh Todd has condemned Venezuela for risking conflict over the contested region of Esquibo, which um, and tensions have escalated over the referendum in Venezuela to confirm its claim to the Esquibo region, which is currently controlled by Guyana. President Nicolas Maduro has sought public approval in a referendum to convert the 160,000 square kilometre area into a new Venezuelan state. The referendum was successful and voters have backed the bid to claim sovereignty of Esquibo as a Venezuelan state. Many saw the referendum as an attempt for Maduro to boost his popularity ahead of the elections, and um, apparently uh, the National Electoral Council in Venezuela has claimed more than 10.5 million ballots were cast in a country of 20 million eligible voters, so just ever so slightly over half of the country voted in this referendum. And um, Escobo is a disputed territory west of the Escobo River, and it's under administrative control by Guyana. And the territorial dispute goes back to colonial times between Spain for Venezuela and Britain and the Netherlands for Guyana. Escobo is an oil-rich and mineral-rich area, and apparently this historic dispute kind of came back up again in 2015 when there was a discovery of oil fields and now the subsequent oil production in Guyana has spurred a significant growth in the country's GDP and further offshore explorations holds the potential for even more oil with an estimate of the uh, of a region of 11 billion barrels putting Guyana on a path to be potentially richer than Kuwait or the United Arab Emirates um, and obviously the territory is also rich in gold and diamonds and aluminium. So you can kind of get an idea now why Venezuela may want this land. Um, and Guyana's GDP has grown um, from, so their, their GDP, the growth in their GDP went up 5% in 2019. It's now leapt to 62% growth in 2022 because of the oil revenue that's coming in. So yeah, so there's this sort of, so now there's real fears that um, with the success of this referendum in Venezuela, that the Venezuelan government may try and militarily retake the Escobo region. And um, yeah, and it, so what we could see is um, a new conflict kicking off in Latin America this, you know, very soon. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on this, Matt. My first question, if mm. I was the National Security Advisor or the CIA Director, my first question here would be, Given the state of Venezuela's economy mm, mm. historically over the past you know decade or so, so the um, food shortages, trouble keeping the lights on, yeah, you know, given Maduro's economic policies and stuff, is Venezuela militarily capable of seizing this chunk of Guyana, even if it wanted to? Well, it's an interesting question that they do have. I don't know. From an equipment level, they're better equipped. I even just going quickly on Wikipedia and seeing the service pistol of uh, Venezuela is a Glock 17, whilst Guyana is a Walther PPK. Uh, well, <laughs> a, I mean, yeah, no, they, like yeah. just on 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 
on paper, the balance between Venezuela and Guyana is like it's it's nothing. You know, Guyana mm. is sort of like just a, a chunk of 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 jungle, and then everyone sort of centered in 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 Georgetown, right? Like the capital. I mean, yeah, just on paper, militarily, yeah, there's mm. not really much of a comparison. But I mean, mounting an invasion of a neighboring country is a huge undertaking. You know, like the Russians were sort of barely able to pull it off in Ukraine. Are they able, even if he wanted to, is he able to 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 pull this off? Or is it just sort of, yeah. you know, is he kind of just hyping it up for uh for a domestic audience? Because this article talks about how that sort of the 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 issue of Venezuela's territorial claims to this part of Guyana mm. are sort of in 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 Venezuela, it's a very sort of unifying issue, no matter on if you agree with Maduro or not, right? So is he using this to sort of gin up national fervor ahead of an election? So is this all specifically just for a domestic audience, or does he actually intend on doing so? And so, yeah, to go back to what I said, if I was the national security advisor or the mm. or the director of the CIA, I would want to know, is he actually capable of backing this up, or is it mm. all just talk? Yeah, well, there's certainly... The Venezuelans are building a new airfield close to the border that could facilitate um, operations if they wanted to. Um, so, yeah, and I think the other thing, the other concern, I think, is like now he's sort of hyped people up. Surely he's going to have to um, do something. But again, yeah, he could drag his heels over that. He could do a lot of um, chest pumping and all that sort of stuff to make people feel like something's going to happen and maybe create some sort of uh, situation where... Um, you know, it could he maybe his ambition is to try and take it back to the international courts or something and see if they can renegotiate things. Um, yeah, interesting question whether they, but certainly on paper they definitely have a better military capability than Guyana at the moment. But whether or yeah. not they have the capacity and the the will to actually do something about it is a very good question. They might, they might not. It might all be just a ruse. But I suppose the interesting thing for me, <laughs> again, I bet people guess what this is already. Um, you know the. Venezuela has been, um, you know, it's been getting military, it's got military, very strong military ties with China, Iran and Russia. Mm -hmm. And could this, a good, somebody have whispered in Madara's ear to make him think that he could succeed in something um, just to cause more chaos, to cause more distraction? Could this be, again, similar to what's happened, allegedly, you know, allegedly what's happened with the Israel thing where it's taking more attention away from Ukraine? Could be. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's not impossible. It's of a certain kind of strategy, you know, mm. that we've seen a lot of this um, it's on the on your last episode mm. with um, Taras Cusio. You talked about the sort of anti-Western axis, you know, and that's that kind of a strategy of seeing a chunk of territory close to your borders, whether that's Crimea, eastern Ukraine, Taiwan, now this part of Guyana and saying, mm. hey, that's mine. I want it mm. and I'm going to come in and take it by force, you know, and especially doing so not so secretly predicated on, oh, they just found all these oil and gas reserves in this part of the country. So, okay, you have a socialist country, a kind of, you know, ideological darling of the Western left. Is that not imperialism? Is that not colonialism? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Especially when, 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 when Guyana's done the right thing. I mean, mm. so... Mm. Uh, Venezuela's laid, laid claim to this part of Guyana since it gained independence from Spain in 1811. Um, and uh, it's been sort of an open issue, like, forever. And Guyana, in 2018, asked the International Court of Justice to arbitrate the matter. And that's still withstanding. So Guyana's doing the right thing. Guyana's doing what mm. responsible countries are supposed to do under yeah. international law, yeah. you know. But he's got to be an asshole. Mm, no indeed indeed it will be very interesting to see if this does kick off what the reaction will be in the, um with the public in the uk us and europe they'll ignore it especially as venezuela has been this sort of darling of the left previously under hugo chavez um and um yeah i just be i mean i can see already the stop the war coalition will will be against any action against venezuela They'll ignore um, it because mm. it doesn't fit their narrative that colonialism, imperialism is only when the U.S., Britain, France, or Israel does it. Yeah, yeah. So they'll just ignore it. Yeah, 
Yeah, indeed. Well, I think everybody else wanted to keep an eye on for the months ahead because um, I don't know whether anything will happen immediately, but we might see that flaring up over early part of next year. So we'll keep an eye on it. And that's uh, why I brought it up today because I just think it's important to kind of keep a broad perspective on what's going on right now because it's very easy to get focused on Israel or Ukraine. Um, and obviously we should never drop our focus on either of those, but it's good to make sure it doesn't blind us to other things that are going on in the world as well. So um, Matt, is there anything else you'd like to add or shall we wrap up and move over to Extra Shot? No, we can wrap up and move over to extra shot. This mm. isn't our. We have we're doing one more of these month, right? Or or, or or is this our last one for the year? So we'll be so with regards to espresso martini. This is our last one for the year. Um, so for everybody who has been listening over over the year and previous to that as well, thank you very much for your continued support. And um, you yeah, know, let me be the first to say to wish you all happy holidays, and I hope that you all have a nice time over the uh, Christmas period. And um, you know, and I hope, uh, yeah, you can have a sort of really nice time, relax, and and sort of get refreshed, ready for what probably going to be a very interesting twenty twenty four. Yes, well, I have to second all that. It's been a um, a very big year on the podcast, very mm. kind of exciting year. Um, and I'm I'm. Uh, more excited to see what the next year brings. I think we got a lot of um a lot of interesting stuff lined up. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. indeed. But we won't be completely leaving over Christmas. There are some podcasts that I've pre-prepared <laughs> um that will be coming out over the Christmas period. So we've got Michael Frost Beckner's returning and he's chatting with author Stephen England about uh, his trilogy of uh books related to Spy Game. Yes. Is that a and, and you is were, that a recording that? first for for the podcast? Have we have you done like a guest kind of like a guest host before a really good question actually i think that is a first i don't think we've had a guest host before right. no yeah, yeah yeah so yeah it was great to get Stephen england on and uh, and them to have that chat uh we've also got james bond director john glenn coming up uh he'll be chatting with us about uh directing the bond movies he worked on and um and then we have alexander rose who's going to be talking to us about a bit of american civil war espionage um so that should be very interesting as well matt so you've got some interesting interviews lined up that you are working on at the moment for january so yes. there's some, hopefully some very exciting content coming up uh, about all uh, quite a wide range of things really so. yeah um one of them is that i'm i'm like frothing at the mouth with excitement to 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 mm. to talk about this one i think it's going to be um very very interesting uh there's a lot of cool stuff that um yeah some of the stuff we're talk about with that that we're going to talk about in this interview mm. that i'm like how is this out mm. in the open you know like how wow yeah i'm waiting wow, for wow. air force uh Air Force counterintelligence <laughs> people to break down my door preparing for this interview. We'll say that. Oh my goodness! Yeah, <laughs> about as about as secret and spooky as it gets. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Well, I look forward to that. Well, Matt, thank you for joining me on this episode. We'll move up to extra shot, but uh, and thank you again, everybody, for listening. Have happy holidays. happy holidays, guys. Make sure you have plenty of eggnog lattes, as they no longer do the. Uh, uh, pumpkin spice latte but there we go <laughs> and enjoy yourselves and uh, take care and uh, we'll catch you in the new year and if you're a supporter we'll catch you on extra show bye everybody take care thanks for listening this is secrets and spies 